Hi, welcome to Kultursal. Sorry it's still cold, uh, but you're here and that's fantastic. So stay bundled up. So for our next panel, we actually don't quite know what it's called yet. We're still working on that. The way it's printed in the program is reinventing music education using technology. And some documents that I have have an earlier title that I think we were also throwing around called New Approaches to Music Education Using Technology. And I think it's really interesting to think about the differences between those two names, like reinventing implies that something is old or broken and in need of fixing, and new approaches sound sort of optimistic and sunny. So I'd like to go into this discussion with both possible titles in mind and see where we end up. Maybe we end up picking one at the end or throwing them both out. I'm going to introduce everybody briefly. Ethan Hine is a doctoral fellow in music education at NYU and an adjunct professor of music technology at NYU in Montclair. State University. Sorry, I forget we're not in that neighborhood. Um, Ethan works for the NYU Music Experience Design Lab, designing uh, interfaces for music learning and expression. Melissa Uye Parker is a British songwriter, uh, performer, and educator based in London, who recently completed a master's in psychology of education at University College, and is working on a mentoring program to support music or to support technology integration in music classrooms. At the end is Jack Shadler, a software developer at Ableton, uh, who spent a number of years working on live and is now working on a microsite for learning music fundamentals. Full disclosure, Jack and I are the team that's working on that. So a lot of what we're going to talk about today is stuff that we talk about at work all the time instead of working. Um, but we're, this is not a plug for our project. If anything, it's sort of about thinking about all of our tensions around this project by talking to people like you who actually know how music education works. Um, Jack's personal work explores the use of interactive media to explain difficult concepts like Fourier analysis, handwriting recognition, and now music theory. Good. That's them. My name is Dennis DeSantis. I want to start with uh, looking into a, a bunch of recent writing that's happened in journalism, particularly in the New York Times. They've been running a series of articles about Silicon Valley and its influence on the classroom. Uh, and there's a kind of amazing quote from a recent article, which I'd like to throw out and we can discuss. The involvement by some of the wealthiest and most influential titans of the 21st century amounts to a singular experiment in education, with millions of students serving as de facto beta testers for their ideas. Some tech leaders believe that applying an engineering mindset can improve just about any system and that their business acumen qualifies them to rethink American education. <sighs> Thoughts about these risks? I, that, sorry, like, I, I think that has the same risk as, um, you know, blindly following research. So if, um, and that there are loads of good things that happen in research, as we all know, but if you just take that and isolate it and chuck it onto a classroom without actually considering any of the experience that that teacher holds and that school holds and all of these sort of ideas that have been fed through education, um, it's just, that's what's dangerous. And it's just, it's not having the sort of the mindset to integrate. And I think fixes and panaceas being thrown, that's, that's the difficulty really. Yeah, I mean, to my mind, like, the central truth of education is it's complicated, right? It's social, and so you've got all the political, racial, gender, class, you know, all the identities of all the individual humans in the room. And, yeah, I would be suspicious of any kind of theory of education or any kind of policy proposal that tries to reduce that complexity, no matter how well-intentioned it is. Um, and by the same token, like, I feel like, you know, small and concrete fixes, that's the kind of stuff that I'm interested in. Um, and I, before we started, um, you were expressing a lot of, like, concern, like, oh my God, by putting up this learning music website, even though we're not specialists in education, are we going to, like, harm a generation of people who are trying to learn music? And I'm saying, no, you just put a tool into the world. Like, people can use it or not. Um, what I like about it is that it's not a gigantic umbrella solution. It's just another kit, you know, another thing in the kit. Could you imagine a comparably sized tool that would do harm? Oh, God, I sort of don't want to. <laughs> I think it's anything that kind of removes the, the teacher's autonomy. You know, if, if, you, if, you give, if you give them, you know, a device, you know, 
in order to be lazy. You know, if you say, stick the kid at this, in this screen and this programme will do all the work for you. And, and you remove any, any of the teacher's presence. And I think that's what's damaging because, as you're saying, all that, all that kind of social noise in the classroom, it's not being accounted for. And, and that's, that's the, the sort of the expertise that the teachers has, has, knowing every single child and how they respond to certain things. So, yeah, I think just to sort of, you know, eliminate the teacher, I think that's probably quite dangerous. I think along with that, there's, there's, some, there's some idea about you can assess things. And I think the, the danger I see with this, this influence from business is business is generally about defining what you want to assess and then optimizing that particular measurement. I think there's a nice aphorism that's like, we don't actually know how to measure what we care about, so we care about what we can measure. And I think that that influence would be incredibly um, damaging in an educational environment. That would be my expectation. I mean, there's a lot of assessment already in classrooms, though, right? Like, we have oh, yeah. to give the kids a grade. And, and well, Victoria Armstrong was talking earlier in her talk about how this doesn't necessarily come from a business mindset, but it's very much using the same kind of methodology. Yeah. Yeah, the, the term is like scientism, right? Like, the idea that um, if it's quantitative, it must be more valid. Um, which is a bummer, because, yeah, learning, like, like anything social... It's really hard to quantify it in a meaningful way. Um, I, you know, we as a society don't even totally agree on what we're trying to accomplish with schools in the first place. We can't really agree on what the goals even are. So, trying to sort of hang like a simple, like quantitative measurement system on top of that fundamental set of disagreements is not really a recipe for success. I mean, one thing that also comes to mind about technology is that it makes it very easy to export Western ideas of education into classrooms. And I'd be interested in what your thoughts are about the implications for that, both good and bad, in terms of music education. Um, so I want to say, even though I am a teacher, I think that most meaningful music education right now is happening outside of classrooms. Um, I mean, for certain, you know, for certain kinds of music, for you know, classical music and jazz, um, the formal training is very important. But for all of the music that we in this room mostly like and mostly make, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I learned all my production sitting in front of my computer in my house, right? Presumably, you guys mostly learned that way as well. Um, you know, and it's interesting that you guys have talked about your, your trepidation about getting involved in education. Um, my buddy Adam Bell wrote a doctoral thesis about how DAWs themselves are the de facto music teachers for everybody working in any kind of popular electronic idiom, rock, country. I mean, people learn that stuff by just sitting in front of the computer and figuring it out. And so in a funny way, the people who made all the presets and all the plugins are the people who trained a generation of audio engineers. The people who designed the affordances and like the editing windows are the people who trained a generation of composers and songwriters. And so in a way, you guys have been doing music education for 10 years. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it seems like if that's the case, then there's also a lot of room to get things wrong, right? You make choices about culture, you make choices about genre that are informed maybe without even thinking about their educational potential. So in, in, in terms of um, so answering that and going, sort of going back slightly as well, in terms of, of sort of um, imposing sort of Western I ideals, um, and I think, you know, we spoke before about the, the one laptop per child and the fact that this, um, this initiative wasn't really supported enough. And sort of doing a, sort of a bit of reading around that, I think there was support there, but it's, it's, it's almost you, you sort of, you leave it, you give it, you know, maybe in your perspective, and then you leave it for, you know, for them, for whoever to take up. And I think that you, you, there needs to be that space to develop themselves, right? So no matter what the situation is, it needs to be enough time to reflect, to sort of kind of critically think, what am I doing here? Um, and then I think their cultural ideas and norms can be sort of imposed on, on whatever activity, whether it's a piece of technology or a programme. So I just think it's, 
you know, I said before, but, you know, I think it's, it's really important to allow autonomy um, and, and promote it and encourage it. Autonomy well. for an individual student? You for, uh, no, actually for, for, the, the for the practitioner. I think that's, um, and hopefully they'll, they'll then impart that as well. Um, but yeah, I just think um, for them to take some ownership and really um, understand what it is they're doing and, and so it's meaningful. And then I, I think, you know, problems of imposing other cultures maybe don't come into it quite as much because you, you've sort of given that, that responsibility. So would, this, would, a, would an approach to this be to create very general purpose tools? To try, I mean, you, this came up in the discussion about web audio the other day, the idea that do these environments for working have suggest ways of working? I'd be interested to, I mean, is it possible for them not to? I mean, if you look at something like a piece of no, notation software or a blank piece of staff paper, it's already telling you a ton of information about what you're allowed to do. I was having an interesting conversation with Yota Mon, who's the author of this library, which sits on top of um, web audio called Tone.js. And we were talking about the affordances that he builds into his software to make sure that he doesn't basically constrain musical possibilities. And he was mentioning that he has a background in, uh, or he took a class um, where basically they looked at different computer music languages and then listened to the kind of music that comes out of these and then critically discussed what is baked into these, these languages that leads to the kind of music that comes out. And I think, I think just, Maybe generally there's this notion that technical people are, I don't want to say but lazy, but they maybe don't engage at more than a superficial level with the disciplines that they might be writing software to, to support the people or the artists or something like this. I think it's, uh, yeah, I think it's a big problem. I think, you, I think the first grab that you can make uh, when you're writing a piece of software is oftentimes not the most open or inclusive um, incarnation of, of what you're trying to make. I mean, you're, you're never gonna be able to build a piece of software that's free from your cultural biases and assumptions. And, that, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, the, you know, the Ableton Learning Music website has a very strong cultural identity to it. You know, it puts hip hop and EDM, um, you know, and related pop styles very much at the center. Um, and it also makes some pretty bold gestures towards, you know, like in the advanced section, you can map 19 tone equal temperament onto your QWERTY keyboard and play that, which I think is delightful. Um, and that's like a pretty strong set of like political statements about music and what music is valid. And I think that's great because that's not the usual set of statements that you encounter in music education about what's valid and what's legitimate. So yeah, if everything in the entire world, you know, had this sort of hegemonic um, you know, kind of set of values, that would be a bummer, but I was really glad to see you guys putting, you know, a Tribe Called Quest, you know, into like a fundamental music theory learning resource. That, that's like a really welcome change of pace for me. Welcome, because what, what, what would you it's, expect? Because it's not Beethoven, right? right okay. Like it's, yeah, we're, you know, getting outside the Western canon at last. But you could put Beethoven into these kinds of structures, right? Oh, and they have, and they do. That's usually, yeah, that's usually what's there. Okay, so this is a, a natural segue to me wanting to point out a quote that, that you sent, and we were exchanging some emails, and you sent this really interesting quote, which I, I want to poke at a little bit, because I think there's something there that is really elegant, but also some things that push me in, a, in funny ways. So Ethan wrote, if we're using computers to deliver 19th century music pedagogy, as many people currently are, the results won't be any better than delivering that material via chalkboard. And so my initial reaction to that was like, hmm, okay. But then I thought about all the ways that technology helped me a hundred years ago when I was in music school. And it was like, you know, if, if, if those of you who went to music school, you have to do all this four part chorale writing and I'm a crappy piano player. So putting it into sequencers, I could like mute things and listen, oh, there's the parallel fifth, now I hear it. And this was technology in service of 19th century music, well, 18th century music practice, I guess. So I guess, okay, I'm gonna leave it at that. That was a statement, not a question, but your turn. <laughs> <laughs> um, so those of you who have not gone to music school, you know, may not know how this works, but um, the Everybody has to take music theory, and what they mean by that is like um, the tonal practices of aristocratic Western Europe between 1700 and 1900, which 
if you're coming from where I come from and where most of you guys come from, seems like a weird and esoteric thing to require everybody to learn, given that everybody doesn't also have to learn, you know, the blues scale, or you know, they don't have to learn how to play the drums, or um, it seems like an oddly specific thing to make everyone learn. And yeah, I. I I don't think there's any harm in learning how to do chorales. Um, I think it would make a lovely elective. <laughs> but requiring everyone to do it, regardless of where they're headed in their life as a musician, seems kind of perverse. My point, though, is more let technology really help me with oh, 19th yeah. century practice. No, no question about that. But if the only thing you're doing is, OK, now we're going to be doing the Western canon in the piano role instead of on staff paper, that's not a huge advance. It makes it easier but it doesn't, um, yeah, it doesn't, you know, liberate the possibilities of that tool, of mm. the piano roll. I think, I think this is, I'm, I'm probably just sort of echoing Dennis here, but with, um, I, I remember in music school, and it was a very different experience because it was popular music, but I still was, I had this shock of having to, um, you know, notate and, and sort of compose in notations for the first ever time, and it allowed me, which I thought at the time, and I think this was quite like destructive language, but it allowed me to cheat, and it allowed <laughs> me to blag my way through, and I was, you know, I was in constant like imposter syndrome um, the whole way through because um, I was cheating, but it was, you know, what it actually allowed me to do, it, you know, it was Sibelius, but it might as well have just been piano roll, and I, I would look at those two sort of acts very differently. If someone was, going to compose in piano roll, clicking and making mistakes and you know, going through this trial and error process, I, I, would, I think I'd have a lighter, you know, even, even myself back then, I'd have a, a more of a forgiven outlook rather than somebody cheating their way through surveillance. But in, in fact, it was just technology that afforded, you know, me to, to be able to express myself and, and, you know, write down what was in my head. So. I mean, I think we'll, we'll get to this more later, Jack, but this is, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it feels to me from knowing you that this is a lot of your work in terms of your solo, so, solo projects, mm -hmm. <laughs> your side projects. The things that you do are about taking a discipline and making people, making it touchable, right? Yeah, I would c consider it to be maybe something like animating old teaching materials. So, for example, some of the things I've done is like taking sections of a textbook from the 1980s, and you can feel the author is wishing that there was something more dynamic and more alive there, and then they maybe uh, attempt to convey this by writing lots of text and paragraphs about, imagine this, 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 and then I just kind of come in as a very humble servant of this mm -hmm. material and say, well, let me just attempt to animate that for you using the skills that I have and the tools I have available to me now in this dynamic medium of the computer. So I think that there's, I think that there's a lot to be said for technology being used to just kind of like reanimate and, and blow a little bit of life into some of this stuff. I can't speak to whether or not it makes sense for people to be learning Bach chorales, but I think that there are lots of technologists that would be interested in maybe making that more, at least more exciting to people, a bit more exploratory. Um, I assign all my intro to music tech students um, to do the interactives on your um, digital signal theory site. He has a wonderful like digital signal theory tutorial. Um, and I, I don't ask them to like read any of the text or try to wrap their head around the math. I say, just go and fiddle with the sliders and see how changing the amplitude of the different sine waves changes the overall shape of the squiggle. You're going to get such a stronger feeling for how, right, like just how sound works doing that than you could get from like a thousand pages of reading about it in English. Um, yeah, for sure, technology makes that kind of mathematical and that kind of technical con uh, conceptual matter way easier. I just realized that we're, we're using this word technology in this very specific way. We're talking about like computers with screens, basically. And I had these questions that I sent to you guys ahead of time about what has technology enabled in the music classroom and what has it taken away? And it occurs to me that you could have asked this question 200 years ago about pianos, right? I mean, it's all technology in some sense. But I want to ask this question anyway, like especially the taken away part, what do you feel is now missing in your technologically rich teaching environments? Um, for, I think that the, the main thing that we need to, I think one of my biggest challenges when I teach is 
is um, just making it a more interactive. So, so um, there, there are certain parts um, and certain units that I can bring children out of, you know, the box really. But then for a lot of stuff, um, I do feel that they're sort of, you know, for the uh, most amount of the time, they're sort of sort of strapped to the screen. So, uh, so for me, it takes that sort of spontaneity where you can just group people up, and, and that's becoming easier. Things like Link, um, but then there are still, you know, there's all. It's a, it's a constant troubleshoot to to make sure we can get that up really quickly, and we've got, a, you know, a way to have four headphones so that may, may involve us getting another mixer. So, I just think, and I, I'm I'm prepared to do that because I'm, you know, I'm focused, and I'm committed to it. I, not everybody wants to scratch their head till you know 11 at night wondering how they're gonna make this happen for the next day. So yeah, for me, I think, I just think that the sort of, the performance ele element is more difficult in an everyday classroom environment. Um, I mean, to my, <laughs> to my mind, all the music technology doesn't take anything away. It's because like the choice is not, you know, if you're some like, freshman in music school and you want to write something for a string quartet, usually the choice is not, shall I have a live string quartet play this or shall I you know, have it be fake strings and Sibelius? No, it's the choice is fake strings and Sibelius or nothing. And certainly when they get out of music school, it's absolutely fake strings or nothing. So to me, like, um, yeah, it just enables a lot of stuff that was not possible or was very difficult before. Um, you know, we, uh, I see a lot of comparisons in the academic world between how we teach like English and how we traditionally teach music, right? And in, in music, you're supposed to learn a lot of stuff before you get to creativity if you ever get to creativity. Whereas in English, they, you start writing stories, you know, in first grade like creative, personal, expressive writing, that's how people learn to write now. Um, and I feel like the, th the wonderful thing about um, making music in the computer is that it lowers the technical barriers to the point where you can teach music the same way. Kids can make pretty good sounding original music starting, I mean, my kids have been messing around with DAWs since they were two. Um, and yeah, that is empowering. How's their music? I mean, chaotic. Um, Say that like it's a bad thing. No, it's, it's, it's <laughs> tremendous. Like, they just have this enormous sense of possibility that I certainly didn't have as a young kid. Mm -hmm. I, have a, I have a question for both of you. As a software person, I spend a lot of time thinking about the fact that uh, the computer is largely interesting because it's kind of universal. And underneath this screen, I can change it to be a piano or a drum pad or... Um, the, it, it's a universal machine. The possibilities are endless, but there's always in the end, the screen, and I worry a lot now about, especially in the context of like a music classroom, the more tools that I make like this, I'm making a statement about removing the need for physicality when it comes to making music. So bashing on this, this glass screen is not maybe the most relevant music making activity. So I wonder about this influence, and I can imagine similarly like if someone told me that you could do visual art completely in the computer, I think that's great, but there's also a lot to be learned from using ink on a piece of paper, and this has a different feel, and there's a different dynamic to that. And I just wonder how much I should be worried about being a software person and getting in on your, your turf when things like physicality are really important. I, th I think you can, you can combine, you can, you can have that physicality. I think that's, that's something that people sort of cry out for. I mean, I, I think there was a lot, there was so much work around the Xbox Connect and having all of this sort of gesture-based movement that I think I got interested in far too late. <laughs> and um, I, like nothing would work. So I'd, I'd download Synapse and it worked and it was brilliant. And then I'd upload, um, update my software and it wouldn't work anymore and there was no support. And it just, it seemed like there was this like awesome movement that allowed kids to, as I was just saying, Get out of the box, and you could talk. I mean, if you if you're talking about changing a parameter, you know, half of the kids don't care. They don't really see 
how this with a mouse is going to be expressionate because that's a concept that they might not get instantly. They might hear it, they might feel it, but they might not. So, but if you can do it with your hand and if you can, if you can make it into a game and you can do it with your whole body, then I think that's, a, that, that's really powerful. So, so, so for me, I mean, it's not, not moving away from the software, but, you know, you're bringing it out from behind the screen. Um, yeah, I mean, hopefully it's not a question of, you know, the computer or the physical instrument. Ideally, it's going to be both. Um, for sure, um, Ableton Live has turned out to be like one of the best things that's ever happened to me in my life as a teacher of the guitar because, you know, everyone hates the metronome. So I'm like, great, forget the metronome. Here's a folder full of breakbeats that you can, mm -hmm. you know, play at any tempo you want. Practice over those, like, because then you actually learn feel, not just correct time. Um, oh, you want to learn some song? Great, let me just warp it out, and then we'll slow it down to the tempo where you can play along with the actual recording of it, but at a tempo that is approachable. For oh, the key is annoying? Great, let's just bump it up to E so that you can, you know, play your open chords. I mean, um, yeah, to me, it's not, okay, put the guitar down because now we have the computer. It's like, no, the computer affords all these new ways of approaching the guitar. It's wonderful. That's a super interesting way of thinking about it. Are there students, and I mean this both in music and then maybe in your experience outside with a broader sense of student as in anybody who's trying to learn something, are there students who are simply hindered by technology who might benefit from a more traditional way of learning, either mentorship or one-on-one -on -one or... Um, I don't. I, I don't think like hindered. Um, I mean, sometimes they. Um, and I spoke a little bit about this yesterday. They are psychologically. I mean, they might hinder themselves, um, and and that's just a matter of overcoming whatever it is in them. Usually, I mean, you're talking about your kids being being super young and and having kind of like no creative bounds, and and they um, and. As, as you've seen, as many people have seen, you develop those, or well, some people develop those after a while, so you get to 16, you're super hormonal, and you can't do technology. So I think, um, sh like, if you just shove and, you know, you, there's, a, there's a kid that wants to study music and they want to study a traditional instrument and, you, and you, you force them to do technology to do it, but you force them to do it, then that's going um, to be really, really difficult for them. So you've just got to... You've got to sort of try you uh, address that transition, really. I think. Um, honestly, I think the biggest threat that technology poses to people's learning is just option paralysis. Mm. Uh, the my first project in Music Tech 101 is, you know, just make a song with the loops that come with your DAW. So the you know the Ableton stock loops, the GarageBand stock loops, uh, and. I warned them, you're going to have to spend about seven hours going through all those loops because there's a lot of them. Um, and yeah, I mean, I have an audio engineering professor of mine said, the reason that people like analog gear is that it doesn't do a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, it just enforces limitations on you, and people find that helpful. Um, but to me, I mean, that's, you know, that's a good problem to have. Too many choices, that, that's the right problem, not I can't make the guitar do what I want it to do, so I give up, which right now is much more than, you know, the more common scenario. That comes up over and over again when we do these talks about creative blocks and creative strategies with artists. They always talk about option paralysis, even at, mm -hmm. the, at, at the professional level, right? Like, you can easily pretend that you're evaluating new gear, but you're actually just procrastinating. So maybe building strict limitations and frames into the tools is a useful way. Do you think about this when you're building tools? Like, I mean, it's clear that you do, but I'm wondering how you do. Yeah, I think the, I think the impulse as a, as a person that does computer stuff or software is to pack in all of the options, because that's the thing that's exciting about this stuff in large part is that you can add more and more parameters and you can create this huge space of possibilities. I think it takes a lot of restraint to pull back on that and basically say, what what is necessary to present or what's tasteful to present. But yeah, I think it's the case where the, the medium is kind of at odds with maybe what you're trying to ultimately do because it pushes you in the direction of, well, just expose everything, make everything tweakable, controllable, and it's probably not the best thing to do in all cases. So I, have a, <clears throat> I, I thought of this question in terms of the um, teachers in traditional classrooms, but I want to open it also up to Jack and, and both of you as well. 
please, Jack, don't say anything that's going to get us fired. But I'm, I'm curious, from whom do you meet resistance in your work? <laughs> you don't have to get into our internal politics, but... <laughs> no, I guess, I mean, the thing that scares me is that I don't meet a lot of resistance, to be honest. So, for example, I posted the digital signal processing thing that you, that you mentioned and is now being used in a number of curriculums for university students. I know this. Not a single person has come back to me and said, actually, I think this is crap. And I think that's kind of terrifying. Um, I don't know exactly what that means. I don't know if the level of educational materials is so low that people are just happy that there's something out there. There's not a whole, okay. <laughs> well, it makes me happy to contribute, but you know, I also find it worrying because then it means that the level of vetting for this kind of stuff isn't super, super high. Um, yeah, so the lack of critical feedback is, I think, troubling. I, I, I think we're at this moment right now where people are very happy to see anything that's, that's well done and has an uh, educational bent to it. And I think maybe, yeah, we just need to be a more, bit more critical. So I would say I don't receive a lot of this, and that, that worries me. Okay, and then reframing the question for teachers and education thinkers, from whom do you meet resistance in your work? Um, I, I think I, it's not so much resistance. I think, I think um, my department and even my school, they're, they're, they're very supportive. But there is a... Uh, I suppose sometimes a fear, like a lack of understanding. So it's, it's, it's that they have to trust a lot for you to implement something. So, you know, when you know, I was part of the push initiative. For anyone that doesn't know, um, you know, Ableton donated some push ones um, to quite a few schools across the world, and my school was one of them. And it was actually quite a feat to persuade them to um, give up a term because that's a critical term that then um, prepares the student for their GCSE. And, and it's actually just realising, well, we can, we can cover all the same things. It doesn't have to be a house music, um, an, re an isolated house music scheme. We can, it can still be house music, but we can, we can still address all of the things that, you know, your film music composition term was going to address. So it's, it's, it's shifting ideas, it's shifting mindsets. and. And, and that's where the resistant is. It's, it, resistance is. It's kind of like these old cultural musical ideas. Yeah, I, I would say the same thing. That um, in like in, certainly at the university level, you know, the question that they ask is always like, well, if we bring in somebody to teach Michael Jackson, who are we firing? Or which one of the Beethoven people are we firing? You know, that like in a resource constrained environment. You know, there are going to be trade offs, and there is a lot of legitimate concern. Like, yeah, sure, kids love rap music, but like, you know, aren't we sacrificing rigor or quality in some way by doing this? Aren't we kind of lowering the bar? Um, and I mean, I have an easy response to that, which is rap music is more interesting than a lot of Western classical music, so no sacrifice there whatsoever. Um, that, you know, Michael Jackson might be harmonically less complex than you know European classical music, but like timbrally, there is a lot going on in there. The you know the process of creating those recordings is unbelievably complicated. The layering of the synths and the guitars and the drums is itself a form of orchestration that, to my mind, is as challenging to you know wrap your head around as learning how to write for strings or for you know for reeds or whatever. Um, but it, you know, like people have to lose their jobs if they're going to create new jobs, and that's uh, I, it's a lot to ask. I mean, I, I follow you on Twitter, and so I know you say these things publicly a lot. But if you say them to your department chair, how does that work? Like, if you say rap is more interesting than a lot of the Western canon, and you're talking to a guy who went to Columbia, and you um, know what happens? Well, the people who would get really bent out of shape by that wouldn't hire me in the first place, so I don't know, it all kind of works out. I mean, no, but uh, um, teaching music technology affords me a lot of privilege because nobody really understands what we're doing. 
Um, it seems very mysterious to the like instrumentalists and the pencil and paper composers. Um, and so there's definitely this sense of like, oh, you're the music tech guy. We have no idea what you do. Have fun. Um, and you know that's not going to last forever as it becomes less mysterious to the you know to the general music making world. But for now, yeah, I have a lot of freedom. So this leads into a question, mostly to start with you, Mel, about teacher training and about what it means to mentor other teachers. Because you said it's going to get less mysterious, but it's not going to do it on its own. Yeah, and I think even like that that sort of mysteriousness is works for you, sort of in the academic level. But I think when you a teacher has to be like both of those things, they have to be a technolo music technologist and they have to be a sort of one that is uh, sort of seeps in, in classical tra tradition, even though I'm not, um, then you, if you have the mysterious, it just doesn't ever appear, you know, it's just, it's ignored. So, um, and, and that's why it's really important, I think, to, as I was saying before, ab about just creating the spaces for, for teachers to learn and, and to um, become curious about, about technology and and not it, it's you know it's not you know me handing over knowledge um, and you know I I'd sort of propose to do it through a mentor scheme but it's not a, a handing over of knowledge it's handing over a, a way of learning and um, and yeah sort of sparking that curiosity and and sort of seeing where where that that teacher could go to be curious and um, and where they can learn from and I think as soon as that starts happening that is a mindset that you can then leave, hopefully, you can then leave alone and that continues to grow and that culture is passed on. So, um, and that's what it, and, because you, you always think, okay, so all the, all the new kids coming up are gonna be technology specialists or they're gonna at least know what they're doing and they'll, they'll come up and they'll have very little like, door knowledge and which is surprising. So it, we're still getting two camps of teachers. So it's, it's more important than it, than it ever was. And especially now, you know, technology is so relevant to children. It's not just this mysterious option. It's, it's, it's the fabric of they, what they listen to and, and what they will most probably end up doing if, if you know, if that curiosity sparks. So, yeah, I, th yeah, I think it's super important. And I guess it's probably common, or at least more common, then it was probably never the case that an introductory violin student was already like a way more burning violin player than their violin teacher. But it's probably pretty common <laughs> in electronic music world that you have kids come in who can show you things in live you didn't know or can teach you things that you didn't know. Maybe not you two, but well, as a new music technology teacher. I learned what side chaining was from one of my students. No, no shame. <laughs> um, yeah, and especially with, you know, on the cultural side, like, you know, I have to have the kids explain what dubstep is to me, like what the word means. Like, I know what it sounds like, but I'm like, what, can you like define what it is though? Because it seems like there are all these micro genres of it. And, um, you know, so I, I had a kid like, you know, give like a kind of history and definition of dubstep and I probably got more out of it than anyone else in the room. That's super interesting. Um, I want to shift over to Jack and sort of seed the floor to you for a little while because I'm super interested in how someone who studied computer science and studied specifically digital signal processing ended up with the interest that you have in making technology to teach as opposed to making a reverb, for example. I, th I think it has a lot to do with kind of the, what excites me about the notion of the personal computer. So I grew up um, always having a computer. I was lucky enough to have that and I always viewed it as sort of a, a creative sandbox for myself or something like that. Um, I think there was this moment when I started working at Ableton, I realized I was working with lots of really smart people um, that I wanted to kind of go back and look at the recent course of study that I did in digital signal processing and see if I really truly understood it because it was prompted by lots of conversations I was having with my colleagues and I started to realize like, hmm, maybe I don't actually understood what I just got a degree in. <laughs> so I went through that process of sort of recapitulating the learning experience and I thought I should I should get this down in basically writing in some form right now so I have it and I can refer to it. So I did that and I did it in a way that I was thought was kind of interesting and aligned with the way that I think about a computer, so very interactive with lots of animations and that kind of thing. And I put it out into the world and it seemed to really resonate with people. And I thought, well, maybe I have, maybe I have a, some kind of knack for this. And then one of my colleagues said, well, you need to read this book by Seymour Papert called Mindstorms. 
this is this seminal book that was written in the 80s about the logo um, programming environment, which is an environment for teaching kids how to do, basically giving kids an environment in which they could deeply internalize fundamental mathematical concepts. And if you kind of just follow this thread and you try to unwind it, you realize that all the entire world of computing that we live in right now, like desktop metaphor, like the desktop software metaphor, object-oriented programming, uh, WYSIWYG text editing, the musical environments that we that we use today, a lot of this stuff was created with the intention of giving it to children, um, and a lot of this stuff was created at the Xerox Park Laboratory in the 1970s. So a lot of these very fundamental aspects of the computing world that we lived in, or act, that we live in, is, were actually conceived of um, as fundamentally educational teaching tools for children. And I think that's a very beautiful uh, conception of computing, and it's, it's, it seems to me particularly relevant right now because it can be very, um, it's easy to be a bit disappointed or um, skeptical about the way that computers are being used right now. So Yotam Mon was talking about this, the notion that basically we're at a crossroads where you can either do things which are targeted towards consumption and passivity, or you can do things which are targeted at, at engagement. I think making tools for people to make things, like Ableton Live is great, but I also think making, making tools for people to learn is very exciting, and it seems to me kind of like to be the destiny of the personal computer in some sense, and I would like to be a part of that, basically shaping that future. You've talked about how this is, I mean, you mentioned Seymour Papert's book, but this is actually like, there's a whole history of early computer science thinkers who had this conception from the beginning, and they're all, the ones who are still alive are all like generally disappointed with the way things have gone, right? Yeah, I think they look around and they're very saddened by the way that things have gone. So in part, I think it just requires lots of people to get excited about this and start making good examples of, of how the computer and technology can be used to educate uh, in clever and interesting ways. Um, so when, after the Learning Music site launched, Peter Kern wrote an article about it in where, on his site? or On his yeah, site. It was on his site. And, you know, so he, first he talked about, you know, the content of the site itself, but then he asked, why is Ableton doing this? Like, what business do they have in music education in the first place? Um, and my response in my head to that was, they have the resources. They can do it. You know, um, computer programmers, like good ones, are expensive, you know, um, and... <laughs> 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 You're in the wrong city for that, but yes, go. Okay, well, <laughs> point in, taken. <laughs> in, the, in the United States, they are expensive, and uh, <laughs> generally, you know. So um, I'm saying, like, you know, it's not like they're competing with a bunch of other awesome interactive, like, music creation browser tools. Like, there are some other ones, and there, you know, there's Soundtrap. Uh, which is like kind of GarageBand in the browser, and NoteFlight, which is basically Sibelius in the browser, and a couple of other things. But it's not like there's this vast universe of well-designed, interactive, you know, I mean, to me it's like, you know, you guys did this super generous thing, putting this out in the world, and we could split hairs about the content or the execution of it, but that would feel very ungrateful, you know, given... Um, how little high quality stuff there is like it. So this leads to maybe the next question. For the teachers here, you're sitting with a technologist who has told you and who has shown that he likes to make things to help teach. So what should he make? <laughs> I mean, not the real him, but okay. the technologist just, in general. Um, I, keep, I keep talking about more gesture-based stuff. I, you know, I really... I'm yet to find something that, you know, you, you could incorporate just just with a webcam. You know, if you've got a Mac suite and you've got this, um, you know, I saw there was, there was something once about, you know, a manipulating and mapping parameters to, like, you know, the corner of your smile. And I just I just think something that is just so easy and switch on a bullet, but not so, for me, it's just not so specific, not... Not so, um, I, you know, I, I like to have that freedom in how I teach. So, um, 
Yeah, when I first started thinking about this, you, you, I'd sort of zone in on particular tools, but then you know, that's a hell of a lot of work for maybe one function or one part of my teaching. So something, something that I can map on, like, a, you know, across my teaching from, you know, 11 to 18. So, gesture. Yeah, stuff that you can do from the neck down, for sure. Um, I, I, was, I wasn't neck up, really. No. <laughs> but you can use your hands. Or, or both, I mean. Yeah. Um, so there's this um, music education school called um, Kodai, where like everything is kind of movement. So um, the way you learn about like 5-1, you know, is like the teacher is playing this chord progression and when she's on five, you're supposed to run around and when she plays one, then you gotta be back at home base. Um, and it's, you know, intended for little kids um, who need to be doing stuff in the neck down, but I think it's stuff that, you know, would be really valuable and enjoyable for people at any age. I certainly enjoy doing that stuff. <laughs> um, and yeah, if you could use more dance-like activities for like music creation, that would be awesome. Um, and beyond that, um, there's um, this Rosetta Stone concept where you know, there's music notation, which for some people is you know, super transparent and wonderful, and for other people is like a major obstacle to learning. There's the piano roll, which you know, for the folks in this room, we probably all think it's delightful, but it's not very human readable um, for performance purposes. Um, you know, there's FFTs and spectrograms, and, um, to me, whenever you can sort of get multiple representations of the same thing on the screen at the same time, when you can see the piano roll and the staff, you know, and the spectrogram all at the same time, and you make a move on the staff and you see how it changes the piano roll, that stuff is a gold mine. Um, and that stuff is very generally applicable because then people who are trying to teach notation to a bunch of producers can use it. People who are trying to teach production to a bunch of classical musicians, uh, musicians can use it. Yeah, that kind of stuff is great. I think this is a really interesting example, the piano roll. I think I look at the piano roll and I'm not a trained musician, but it, to me that looks like something that a technologist would come up with, maybe not a musician. Uh, I think that there are these possibilities now, if you look at something like web audio, there are three million JavaScript developers in the world, and they all have basically now a, a set of tools for making musical experiences. And a lot of these people are incredibly talented, and they're cross-functional, so they can write the code to do the audio stuff, and they can do design and this sort of thing. And I wonder how to get these people in contact with someone like you, and you say, I would like to reconceive of the piano roll. I wonder how we get that conversation started, to basically get you hooked up with these people uh, to work on these kinds of projects. It seems like a great opportunity, but also challenging to get this set up. Well, let me make a plug. So, as Dennis said, I'm part of this research group at NYU called the Music Experience Design Lab, and the whole reason for it to exist is to get the music tech people and the developers and the desi designers in a room with the music educators. Um, and it's surprisingly difficult to make that happen um, I mean, they, you know, music tech and music ed at NYU were on, you know, on adjacent floors of the building for 40 years before this lab finally started and got them talking to each other. Um, so, yeah, come hang out at the lab. We'd certainly be happy to have you. That applies to, you know, really all of you. I mean, I think that gets to something that you said in an email to me, where you, and you talked about this earlier, too, that technologists just seem unwilling to be humble enough to admit that they don't know enough to teach certain topics. Like, it probably goes both ways. You probably have music educators and music technologists who have a very particular, like, I don't want to, I mean, this isn't necessarily a bad thing, but we got a lot of email when the Learning Music site launched that was like, great, put notation in it. And I was like, we could do that. We could also make things much weirder and start thinking way more outside of the box, right? Like, as soon as you put a piano roll in it, and, not or, and or notation, because they're essentially doing the same thing, you're making lots of choices. You're making choices about you know, equal temperament, and these are the pitches you get to work with, and et cetera. So, but on the other side, also technologists are often trying to do this kind of work without understanding the initial discipline. So maybe your lab has solved all these problems. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, totally, no. Um, you know, um, something that we're working on right now is just a way to um, represent all the chords and scales graphically. Um, so it's easier to understand them as like a sequence of whole steps and half steps. And 
just getting the accidentals right, I can see why Ableton just puts everything in sharp so much simpler. <laughs> I know it's awful, but like <laughs> once we started getting in there, once you start getting into like, you know, how do you do the sharps and flats in the octatonic scale and like, you know, especially in like C sharp or D flat, you start getting double flats and double sharps, it gets to be really horrible. It's a, it, it turned out to be a really difficult problem that we're nowhere near, like just chasing down all the edge cases um, is tough. And, um, I don't know why I started talking about that. <laughs> um, yeah, except to say that um, you know the the Western notation. It's like the QWERTY keyboard. You know, it, we sort of got here through this path-dependent sequence, and now we're kind of stuck with it. Um, but it does exist in the world, and there are millions of people using it. And um, yeah, I don't. I think it would be sad if the learning music website was only in notation, but to have people be able to jump back and forth between between that and you know these newer systems that we think are cooler, um, you know, people need it. Your experience in the lab when you're working with, uh, so your perspective as the musician, then you have maybe a developer that you're working with. Do you notice that there's an imbalance of power in terms of the technical person kind of always having to say, or they they seem to think that they're the most important person in the conversation? So you say, hey, we really need this to correctly show sharps and flats, and they say, well, that's too hard, or that's going to take a long time, and then you, like, how does that work out in your lab? Um, yeah, I mean, the developers just have de facto veto power, because if they don't feel like doing something, then it doesn't get done. Um, but, you know, it's a, I mean, it's an academic lab. Um, people are getting paid, but not well, and a lot of the work is done on a volunteer basis. So, I mean, people are coming in with this very collaborative mindset to begin with. And, you know, usually, uh, especially, you know, the younger developers love just being told what to do with clarity, you know, having like a clear set of needs um, that someone has that are like, oh, great, you have like a really specific problem that needs to be solved. That's so much better than the usual working environment where nobody's totally clear on like what the requirements are. Um, so yeah, the sharps and flats thing, actually, like, the devs have been having a lot of their version of fun trying to logically iron all this stuff out. Um, but yeah, it is a, I mean, it is a problem that the only problems that get solved in this domain are the ones that people like you happen to find interesting, for sure. That's so sad. <laughs> That's why we're talking. That's yeah. why we're talking. Um, to flip the question around, what what should a technologist not make for you? I mean, I think the easy answer is like, don't make a social network that throws an election, for example. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, maybe a more nuanced answer than that, specifically that about your practice. Like, what's going to make music education worse? Um, anything that can link it too closely with... <laughs> what the problem is already so so like nothing with assessment in it you know like don't 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 assess the clicks that they do and you know i just i think and it's really easy to do that because that is if if you ask teachers and you, maybe on like a monday morning you could ask me and someone's been like down my neck about assessment i'm like well we need to we need to measure this but i just think you know, it needs to m kind of move away from these problems of, around music curricula. So, um, yeah. But then, then for me, yeah. Sort of, as I was saying, it's broad and and you know, something that I can be creative with. But yeah, no assessment. <laughs> um, I mean. All these tools have unintended consequences that are positive and negative, right? Um, I, I like to think about auto-tune a lot. I really love auto-tune um, as, a, as a pedagogical tool. Um, it, it's very empowering for people who are not singers like me to not be able to sing any wrong notes. Um, and there are you know, plenty of like, voice teachers out there who are horrified by the idea that um, <laughs> kids could be learning this, but ironically, what um, like studio engineers have been reporting is that it has unintentionally made people's untuned singing better because our expectations for in-tune singing are so much higher now. Like, 
you know, you listen to like the Beatles, I love the Beatles, but they're singing, uh, at, you know, some of those harmonies are a little sour, whereas now you hear everything is always perfect. And so people are like, oh, I gotta really bring it. <laughs> I gotta sing in tune in the booth now. Same with quantization and timekeeping. Our, ex our expectations of timekeeping are a lot stricter than they were in earlier generations. And you, know, you might say, ah, oh, the drum machine has made everyone too lazy to learn how to drum, but in reality, it's made everyone be like, ooh, I gotta. So for all of you, in a very general way, what's your bold vision for five or 10 years from now? And also, what's your nightmare dystopia? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so my bold vision uh, would be, I'll start with that one, I'll start with optimism. Would, um, it just, it'd be full integration. I think it'd be, um, just value added to technology and it just it not being a novel thing and and just you know it just it, it be implemented in teacher training so that we're not sort of chasing our tail when we when the teachers start um and just yeah five years it's not that long away so i i think at least we are moving in the direction that, that we need to be um yeah, and I just, I, I, and hopefully by then we'll have a different government um, in England and we will, um, there'll be more money in the arts and music will be valued on its own apart from the other subjects, apart, you know, aside from the core subjects. And it won't be, we won't quantify it in the same way as we quantify maths because it's a different beast. Um, so hopefully people start realizing that when, you know, when we've tried to delete it and, and you know, that, the effect that that might have on morale or just, yeah, you know, the school system and it'll be nice, it'll be nice to go back into that direction. Mm. Um, my utopian situation, um, Jack has got this book in his lap um, called Lifelong Kindergarten by um, oh. Mitch Resnick. <laughs> and in it, he talks about how you know, kindergarten is kind of the best part of everyone's educational experience. It just kind of goes downhill from there. My son is in kindergarten right now, and like, he's having the best time. He loves going to school. He can't wait to go to school in the morning. Um, and mostly what he's doing is making stuff with his hands. And I mean, he's learning a lot, but um, he, a lot of the learning they're doing is with like gestures and dance and like singing songs. Like they sing songs about math, no joke. Um, they make jewelry, um, and my utopian scenario is that the way that we teach music much more closely resembles the way that like little kids are in art class, where like here's the materials, maybe there's a goal that you're working towards, but the point is just you're doing it with your own hands, you're pretty self-directed, you make a god-awful mess, the end result maybe doesn't look like much, but that's okay. Um, yeah, I would love music education all the way up to university level to look a lot more like that. Yeah, as to the dystopian scenario, all people do is standardize tests. Mm. I think it's like a continuation. If it keeps going the way it's going, then that's, that's dystopia. Ooh. So let's just stop that, maybe. <laughs> it's like enough people to stop that. But yeah, I think the way in, in my in my experience in, in my school, the way it is going is, you know, we are being more devalued and, um, and that will turn into, you know, it will, will turn into no music. You know, there, there are music departments are being shut across the country. Um, there are a lot of departments with one person in, that person leaves and they shut it down or they'll merge it with drama and so there'll be a non-music specialist teaching. So yeah, it, it, it is pretty, you know, it is grim, um, but um, it, c it can also, I think there's also loads of really sort of encouraging things. Um, so I'm just, I, I keep looking at those. It's a dark reality there. <laughs> yeah, I think dystop my dystopia has largely to do with assessment, assessment or um, this trend towards dehumanizing people and representing them as a bucket of numbers which you can measure and optimize for certain trends in these measurements. I think that seems really distasteful. I f am actually very hopeful, and I'm very hopeful for the utopian vision. And I think 
just because my perspective as a software person, what I'm seeing right now is we're now getting to the point where creative, well-meaning individuals can actually execute on a complete vision of software. So I look at something like Groove Pizza, that would not have been possible maybe 15 years ago. 10, five even years ago would have been tough. And it's, a, it's an amazing experience. And you imagine that there's going to be a, pro, there's going to be a proliferation of this kind of uh, thing. And I think it's going to be really lovely. And I, my utopia is you have technologists intermingling, intermingling with um, people from other disciplines and then creating these very engaging, exciting experiences. And I think that will happen. I, I really do. I want to open it up for questions. We have about 15 minutes left. There's microphones on the side, so just get up and line up behind the mics and... Oh, wow. Okay. We're going to try to get through as much of this as we can. Wow. If you have a question, just head up to the, to the mic and, uh, and wait in line. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick this side first. Hi. I feel like I'm in heaven listening to you guys being here uh, this weekend, so thank you very much for curating this event. Um, my name is Liz Dobson. I come from Huddersfield University. Um, I'm going to say three things and then try and explain it and then see what your response is. Um, my, my PhD is in the social psychology of creative process in music technology education. And I feel like um, we need to activate metacognition, knowledge about process, um, through dialogue, through discourse. And why? Because the processes that we're engaged in or they're engaged in induce a kind of creative trance and therefore the responsibility of the development of the software feeds into the idea that who is actually writing the music. So I get a lot of students come in who are very heavily led by what the software is telling them to do. They, in, they get engaged in what Csikszentmihalyi calls flow, which is immersion, which is used a lot in games, psychology of immersion and all of that. So, and that's, he relates that to enjoyment. And when we try and teach them something else and disrupt that enjoyment and that feeling of learning that comes with that is uncomfortable. Um, so we do a lot of stuff where we get all these different technologies out and they have to dialogue. Now, Lev Vygotsky, a child psychologist, said that language is the tool for, for the psychological tool for higher mental development. So if you ask somebody, explain how this Ableton push works to somebody else. I interviewed Erin Barrow a couple of months ago, and that's exactly what she does. She gets 11-year-old girls explaining to adults how this push works, and it's so empowering, but it also helps them to realize, like, if you can't explain compression, maybe you don't actually understand it. So by getting students to engage in a kind of intermental development process, they're learning, they're co-developing, co learning together. So, I would love to see software that isn't just fetishizing the, the technology, but provoking them to be, become more metacognitive, I don't know what the word is, but more self-aware about how they engage with that technology and what it is that they're actually doing. Yeah, give it up. Right? Yeah. I want people to also make their own software. Maybe I'm... Maybe this is the uh, horribly utopian vision or an uh, unachievable one, but I would love it if instead of, oh God, now I'm going to get fired. I would love it if instead of people using live, they also <laughs> made their own live, you know? I think that would be, that's where you in the end want to be. I would love that too. If, if there was something where uh, they were building things from scratch and understanding the process of that as much as the results and igniting that inquisitiveness about all of music technology through and all of what creativity means as well. Yeah, the, I mean, the constructionist perspective, like if you can't explain what the compressor is doing, if, maybe if you try to build one, then you'll be able to. My experience is that that's absolutely the case. But I mean, that, that seems like a heavy lift now, but on the other hand, the idea that I would be sitting here with like, you know, a professional quality you know, electronic music studio in my jacket pocket would have seemed pretty crazy 20 years ago too, so. I'm talking about undergraduates when I say compression. I wouldn't expect like a younger student to try and explain that. But yeah, the principle is there. But I mean, actually, why not? Like if you tell a younger student, imagine that when it gets too loud, someone turns it down. That's kind of what compression is. I think I could imagine a little kid understanding this concept. Maybe not the, the electronics, but maybe the principle that you don't want things to be too loud. 
some kind of system where students can explain this to each other via the system or in the classroom together, but also online maybe uh, would be would really activate their gray cells. That's great. Yeah. We move over to this side. Hi, I, I have a question for Ethan. Um, I've, I've taught music technology at the high school level since 2006, and in doing that program, I've encountered some of the greatest resistance I've seen from other music teachers. Usually it's not my administrators or my students, but other music teachers. Uh, yeah, I, I, earlier you said something like rap music is better than Beethoven. You said something like that. <laughs> I, I said something similar at a conference one time, and I literally had a guy stand up and like yell at me in the middle of the speech. Uh, my students have been kicked out of the music convention for playing music. Uh, I, how do you speak to the, the, uh, the inherent, uh, when you're teaching music, future music educators, certainly you're getting some of that too in your classes, and I'm curious how you deal with that. Uh, it's, it's a growth area. I mean, it's much easier talking to you guys where you're all like, yeah, right on, um, than it is, uh, I mean, it's, it, 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 the reason it's so heated is that it's not an aesthetic conversation. It's a political conversation. We're talking about the era of Western European cultural dominance drawing to a close and the era of like the African diaspora, not just occupying popular culture, which it's done for a hundred years, but now starting to infiltrate like highbrow culture too. People find that very threatening. Uh, many of those people voted for Donald Trump. If I knew how to better engage those people, my Twitter feed would be a much calmer, more civilized place. <laughs> I, I, I'm open to suggestions if you guys have them. And I, I found personally that like once people saw that it worked and I was getting like results from it, they would they would kind of shush about it. But but I don't know if you what it, what that looks like. You probably have seen people turn around. Like what does it look like? Do they say like? Wow, my mind is open now. Or like, do they, like what? Like, there has to be something that you, you can get that. You know, like, I'm sure you've seen it. Uh, well, I mean, for the student, you know, so I'm teaching in this like classical music conservatory at Montclair State University, and some of the kids, you know, are like, I only listen to Sibelius. I literally had a 19-year-old say that to me, and. Uh, some of them, you know, you can't reach, but some of them get a taste of, you know, personal creativity and of getting to express their own whims in the music, sometimes for the first time if they've been in the classical pipeline the whole way up, and they find it intoxicating and liberating and empowering, and uh, they never want to turn back, so. Yeah. You too, man. <laughs> back over to this side. Hi, my name is Max Wilde. I teach at Dubspot in New York. And this is a big topic, but I had hoped that we'd kind of uh, talked about it a bit, which is online education, and especially how you see the future of that being more interactive, especially considering that right now, most of the formats are very video-based, and then there's a little bit of interaction with the instructor. But I wanted to hear your views on that. and how we can change that in the next five years. I had a thought today. There's been the promise ever since television came out that television was going to revolutionize education, and that didn't ever happen, right? But it seems to be happening now, I would argue, if you look at something like YouTube. And I think the reason that that happens is because the, the tools are now good enough for an enthusiastic and dedicated educator to make amazing materials and put them up on YouTube. So somehow the promise of technology being used as an educational tool is actually happening. I think but, the sorry to interrupt, but that doesn't explain interaction. There's a bit more interaction, but not like you would get in a classroom. It, you're absolutely, I'm being too long-winded. So the thing about interaction is that, I think it's the fact of the matter is right now it's still really, really hard to make good interactive software. So if you look at the stuff that uh, your lab is doing, like this is top-notch stuff and it's, it's literally pioneering. And the reason it's working, I think, is because you have really good developers working on it. But the, what needs, in my opinion, what needs to happen in order for this to actually start to pick up steam is you need people like Yotaman to 
to make these amazing tools then make them freely available. I think this is happening, but yeah, making, making the software is really hard. Back over here. Hello. Um, kind of builds on that point, actually. Uh, my name's Amy, and I'm a PhD computer science student looking at accessibility in instruments. Um, so I have a little question about open source and uh, the music industry um, from being an, an ex-audio engineer. I know that it's very proprietary, and there's, there's a lot of barriers about that kind of thing. And like what you're talking, Jack, about people building software themselves and doing that, I see... Um, I'm a campus rep for GitHub, so I see a lot of people putting stuff on that platform and collaborating on free software together as a community. And I guess I want to ask why, uh, like, well, where you see that going from uh, an Ableton point of view and how, um, from a teaching point of view, perhaps you would s see ways that you could engage in that. Because obviously not everybody is going to look at code bases and do all of that stuff, but the way that we use GitHub as campus experts isn't for any of that. It's for documentation. It's for collaboration on issues and events and stuff. So uh, there's a lot of things that can be done in open source that I feel that would be beneficial here, and I want your views on that. Okay, I think so. I think one really important thing is you have to have a platform, and I'm, that's personally one reason why I'm excited about the web is because you now have like a miniature audio engine in every single browser anywhere in the world. So any developer can crack open the the JavaScript console and start creating not a professional quality, but a... I've had some fun with it. It's great. It's great, right? It's great, yeah. And then I, what I think is interesting is that people are going to share their code because for some reason that's the current development culture, especially amongst web developers, is to share their stuff and put it online. I think there are various reasons for this. Some of them are well-intentioned and some aren't, but that's, that's what's happening. I, I think in order to get it from the level of developers to maybe people who could do something, People that don't have those skills, we just basically need to build towards, build those capabilities outward, and it's just going to require lots of people creating libraries and tools and that sort of thing. But I think the exciting thing for me is that there's now a solid foundation, a solid open and free foundation for this stuff. From Great. a teaching point of view, sorry. Sorry, go ahead. Do you do you think? I mean, uh, I I don't know how much. Uh, as um, not software engineers, you know about the open source movement and everything around those code bases. But what would make you? Uh, what would make it more accessible for you to to go towards that kind of stuff? So, so for me, I would. Um, you know, I've always loved the idea of of sort of um, grabbing sort of like shareware or anything that um, I can I can use to explain something. So we you know we have live intro. So sometimes I'll have to bring in a synthesizer or just so I can, you know, I can talk about synthesis. So, you know, part of going back to my, my research project, part of that was, was encouraging teachers to go out and maybe grab, find some open source stuff, find something that they could, um, or find some shareware that they could then Im implement into their own practice. And what was difficult was it felt a little bit like a scary sea for them and they, and they didn't. So it ended up, I was having to recommend it to them. And so even though I don't have expertise in that area, I kind of knew a way to, to sort of get there. But I think for you know, a complete novice, it's, it's a minefield. So, so maybe just some clearer guidance, I think, and you know, libraries, as you were saying. Cool, thank you very much. Thanks. They told us we could have five more minutes. We probably have time for a couple more. Let me move over here. Uh, hi, um, I'm a German uh, secondary music educator, and um, to be honest, I'm a little bit irrit irritated about how um, your understanding of music education is, uh, because for me, and I think I can partly speak for my colleagues here in Germany, um, we are doing a lot um, of dance, we are doing a lot of movement, we are doing a lot of improvisation, we are inventing sounds with, with things here uh, inside the classroom, and there are so much more th more things uh, we do than just um, uh, how did you call it um, transporting Western art music heritage. And for me, the main question is even if you guys are uh, doing a workshop here called "Don't Let Music Theory Bully You." So music theory is important. It's not the important thing. It's just a part of it. So the main question for me is how do you achieve to incorporate music technology into these other very important fields. And you were already talking about gesture, uh, gesture about movement, about 
um, embodied interaction. Uh, and I think these are the main questions, not if black or white, um, then much more the question, how do you incorporate these uh, multiple musical activities to, to get it all together or m maybe to use technology in a, in a fr um, uh, fruitful way, yeah. Uh, I know that there are a lot of European countries whose music education cultures are much more progressive than the United States and it sounds like Germany is probably one of those countries and I mean, you know, the UK like embraced popular music education long before the US did. Mm -hmm much like the UK embraced rock and roll long before the US did, for that matter. Um, so yeah, this is going to vary by region, for sure. Yeah, I, I, it, it varies by, by school, you know, like one, one per, we, we had a talk by um, Mike Hayden yesterday that was, was talking about how he finds a, a curriculum actually quite free in, and, and another system can look at a curriculum and, and, and find that really rigid. Um, so I, 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 de I think it de depends from, from country, but it also de depends on institution as well and, and, and what, what opportunities you can see in, um, you know, uh, an assignment brief. And to some people that might be really restricting, but, but you, there is creativity that you can find. And, um, and I think some of these issues are important to consider um, and it's not one or the other. It's not, it's not just, you know, movement or, or this political side either. So yeah, I don't know if that answered. Thanks. I have a quick one. Yep. So I do have a suggestion uh, for software. Um, coming from a, I, I taught instrumental music, like traditional band in the US for about 10 years and then accidentally started teaching music tech full time. And one of my greatest challenges was to reconcile the different terminology between the production world and the music, uh, traditional music world. So I would love like a Google Translate app for my <laughs> teachers. So like you, you roll it over a pitch and it gives you the frequency. You roll it over dynamics and it shows you automation curves. You roll it over um, a, a, a dynamic marking and it gives you an amplitude, you know, something like that. Um, and then another great kind of software would be to be able to analyze the skill sets of incoming um, maybe faculty candidates or music teacher candidates so that you can, you know, schools of music uh, can, uh, by and large, the, the, the people who select the faculty are steeped in uh, more traditional ways and they may not have a way to evaluate candidates with newer skill sets. And if we don't propagate newer skill sets among college faculty, then we can't expect them to propagate those skill sets among music teachers. So um, those kind of analytics would be very helpful. Can I just say, like, the, uh, the Spectrum Visualizer in Live, you mouse over, like, different parts of the thing, and it shows you, like, the note name and the frequency. I use that in the classroom every year. That is super valuable. So, yeah, from Ryan's mouth to God's ear. Okay, I think we, we might have time for two more. Let's start over here. It's more of a comment on uh, 10 years of the burial album Untrue. And I think one of the reasons why that uh, is emotionally, sorry, is emotionally resonant to me and a lot of people is because it not only uses uh, traditional melody and harmony, but it um, um, samples video games, for example, amongst many other things. But, you know, you hear like gun shells hitting the floor from, I think it's Metal I can't remember the video game. I guess the point is, is that that record was really resonant to a lot of people because it hit the zeitgeist. It was something that was not harking back 200 years. And I think that in a way to connect kids to the music that they, or to, to make kids excited about music, connect them to the zeitgeist. What are they listening to? Is it a video game? Cool, let's sample the video game or whatever it is. Is it like a Vine or something on Instagram? I, I don't know what it is, but something that they can relate to and just because it's you know a gun shell hitting the floor from the from the a video game. You can use that and make music out of it. And I think the burial album is a good example of that. Maybe that's a a way to connect. So it's not just like a piano roll like you're saying, but it's like it's a it's a scene from an Instagram post, and you just sample that thing and then slice it, move it around. I'm not really sure, but I think that's something. One of the things that I really loved about that album because it hit a zeitgeist and it was it was. Uh, taking a lot of things that weren't necessarily 
music and making it into music. I don't know. Does that make any sense? Yeah, Absolutely. it does. Yeah. Thanks very much. There's like a bunch of really good assignment ideas in there. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, take some sounds from a video game that you love. Take an Instagram video and make a piece of Yeah. No, but I mean, that's, I, I, anyways, I, I, I think that's, um, that's something that a lot of people miss is that, you know, we, I mean, I came from a jazz background. I came from like studying like music theory and all that. And that was great for me older, like later on. But a lot of kids just want to hang out and play video games. But just use that video, I don't yeah, know. Yeah. Is there, like Baudelaire, patron of, mo of modern life, is there an equivalent kind of piece that addresses a similar issue for music? Or maybe there's an opportunity to write this essay? Yeah. yeah, I think that's an opportunity. Let's end on an opportunity. Thank you to Ethan Hine, Mel Uye Parker, and Jack Shatler. <laughs> <laughs>